charge. Uh, <laughs> um, for those of you uh, who uh, haven't had a chance of meeting over the last couple of weeks, uh, my name is Sriram. I'm uh, in the Department of Computer Science uh, with an appointment also in Human Genetics. Um, so originally, I guess I was, uh, I, I thought I'd speak about uh, deep learning um, and its application to some population genetic problems. Uh, on the other hand, uh, my student, Arun, yeah? Okay, my, this one. Okay, better. Okay, um, yeah. So I think originally uh, the schedule was uh, that I was speaking on deep learning, but uh, uh, I don't know. Arun, he's here. He is. He has a highlight talk in Recom Genetics after this conference, uh, which will touch upon. Uh, some applications of deep learning, so I'd encourage anyone who's around to go to his talk. Um, but what I'm going to be talking about today is very preliminary work. It's part tutorial, uh, part preliminary work, but I think it might be interesting uh, to get your feedback on this. Um, and uh, this is about PCA, and uh, we've already had an excellent overview of population structure and PCA as being one of the methods to learn about population structure from John. And so today what uh, I'm going to do is use that as a starting point to uh, delve a little deeper into issues with uh, principal components analysis. So let's start with a very simple example, just so that we're all on the same page. Um, so you're making some measurements. Um, so here are some data where you're measuring uh, the parent's height and the offspring's height. So on the x-axis, you have parent's height. On the y, you have offspring's height. They're correlated. So you have every dot here associated with a pair of numbers. And the goal is you want to find a compact representation for this data. So the idea is the x and the y coordinates are correlated. So perhaps you can get, a, get by by not storing two numbers, but maybe a, a little bit more than one number. So that's the idea of doing dimensionality reduction. And principal components analysis is one method amongst many to do dimensionality reduction. So in this example, so we have data lying in 2D. And so one way to try to represent the relationship between the x and y is by a line. So we might try to figure out if there is a line that best explains the relationship between the x and y. And so now, for a given line, you can represent it by two numbers in 2D. And then every point gets represented by its projection onto the line. So now every point gets represented by a single number. right? So this is where the compression happens. But of course, with that compression, there's a loss. So different lines lead to different losses. And so now the question is, let's find a line that best captures the original data. So here is one possible line. And you'll see that the blue is the projection of the red points onto this line. But it's kind of clear that this is not capturing the trend in the data. So maybe there's another line, maybe this one. And we might agree visually that this is capturing the trend. So the goal of principal components analysis is to find a representation, in this case a line, uh, which minimizes the Euclidean distance between your original points and the projection. So in other words, you want to minimize this distance. Right. So that's the basic setting of PCA. Now, when you think about fitting lines to data, uh, an obvious other method that you might have encountered is linear regression. And so it's good to understand the relationship between linear regression and PCA. So this is fitting a linear regression to the same set of points. And so what linear regression is doing is it's trying to minimize the vertical distance from each of these points to the line. Whereas principal components is minimizing the Euclidean projection from these points onto the line. Right? And it's useful to keep this uh, relationship between linear regression and PCA in mind, they are actually fairly closely related. And another way to think about PCA, in fact, is to think of it as doing a regression where your x-axis has errors in them. Right? So here, you're assuming that you observe the x perfectly and the y has an error. But now imagine if both the x and the y have an error and you try to fit a line, then it turns out that the natural algorithm to do is to compute PCA. So that's a very simple example. Now let's move to genetics. So we have data that's gen genotype data. So it's a matrix 
Every column is an individual. Every row is a SNP. And the entries are zeros, ones, or twos. And our goal is we want to compute principal components analyses. Um, and the reason for doing this is several fold. One is visualization. You want to look at the data and see if there is structure, as John mentioned in his tutorial. Another analysis is uh, to use it as covariates in downstream association studies. So in general, when we are computing principal components on genetic data, we often are interested in a small number of these principal components of the order of 5 or 10. And so that's going to be important in a lot of our discussion, the fact that we don't need the principal components on, uh, on a big subspace, but a fairly small subspace. And this is kind of the output that uh, you'd get out of these analyses. So here you have taken your genetic data. This is genetic data from European individuals. Uh, this is from uh, a paper in 2008. And uh, these are the projections of each of these individuals onto the first two principal components. And then you can either visualize them or do other kinds of analyses based on these projections. All right, so um, I have this talk structured in three parts. First part, I want to just talk about PCA itself and go into the mathematical formulation so that we are all on the same page. Um, in the second part, I'll talk about probabilistic PCA, so a probabilistic model for PCA. Um, and in the third part, I'll talk about scalability issues. How do we apply PCA on large scale data sets? And of course, feel free to interrupt me at any point if things are, are unclear. All right, so here is the problem formulation. So we are given n data points, xn, x1 to xn. Each data point is a vector in m-dimensional space. So it's a length m vector. And then we are given some number k here. So k is like a target uh, for how much compression we want. And the goal is we take our original data, xn, and we'd like to approximate it by a linear combination of k ve vectors, w1 to wk, each of these being an m length vector. Okay. And so the z's, which is a number, is the projection of my original data point onto each of the k vectors. So in a sense, we are trying to find a linear transformation, w. So there's a matrix w, which is obtained by stacking together these k vectors of length m. So this matrix is an m by k matrix. And we have projections, which are k numbers associated with each of these k vectors. And we can represent this compactly by multiplying this matrix w by the vector z. And so just to be clear, w is shared across all of your data points, all your n data points. z is specific to each of the n data points, because it's the projection of the nth data point onto the subspace spanned by the vectors w. We assume that the data is centered. So when you add up across the, each of the rows, it sums to 0. And what remains to be done is this is an approximation. In general, we can never exactly reconstruct our original data points. So we have to define what we mean by this approximation or what we mean by the quality of this reconstruction. So a natural thing to do is to look at the Euclidean distance between our original data, xn, and the reconstruction, w times zn. And you look at the sum of the squared Euclidean distances. And that is our cost function. So this cost function depends on two quantities. It depends on w, and it depends on z. And we want to pick w and z to minimize this cost function. So that's the PCA objective. And we can rewrite this. Sometimes we'll rewrite it in matrix format. Instead of summing over n of these data vectors, we can write it as x being our data matrix. It's an m by n matrix. And we are factorizing x into two matrices, w and z. So w is an m by k matrix. z is a k by n matrix. So you can think of this as finding the best rank k approximation for the matrix X. And this is just uh, what is called the Frobenius norm, which is taking a matrix and taking every entry, and you square it and sum it. And that turns out to be equivalent to the quantity on the left. Right? 
This problem in itself is not well posed. There are infinite solutions. And so to make this identifiable, we need some constraints on W or C. So a constraint that is often imposed, and that leads to PCA, is that the columns of W are orthonormal. Right? So inner products across Ws are 0, with each with itself is 1. And so this constraint optimization problem leads to PCA. And of course, the solution, one of the reasons why PCA is used as often as it is, is you can compute the solution in closed form. And the solution is obtained by doing an eigen decomposition. So the idea is you take x, you compute the covariance matrix, the sample covariance matrix, and compute the eigen decomposition of this matrix. And you set your w, your subspace, to be the top k eigenvectors of the sample covariance matrix. By the top k, we mean eigenvectors associated with the largest eigenvalues. So some issues with PCA, as we have defined it. So one of the challenges is actually doing this eigen decomposition. So how would you generally do this? One is you compute all possible eigenvalues and eigenvectors, and then just restrict to the top k. And so to do this, you can do a singular value decomposition of your data matrix. And singular value decomposition has this time complexity. So it generally depends on the smaller of m and n. But if you assume that SNPs are large and individuals are small, it has a time complexity that can be quadratic in the size of your sample. So it quickly becomes infeasible for large genetic data sets. Now there are another class of algorithms. These are quite useful in the setting that we care about, which is if you don't care about computing all of these eigenvalues and eigenvectors, but simply the top k, where k is a small number. And so there's been a lot of literature in the numerical linear algebra community for how do you do SVD using kind of randomized algorithms. And so there's a very nice review, if, if you're interested, uh, in a paper in 2009. And we'll come back to this class of methods in just a bit. So this offers one way of surmounting the computational difficulty. So that's one challenge. Now let's look at another set of challenges associated with PCA, which is less to do with computation and more to do with modeling. So often it's unclear what are the assumptions that underlie applying PCA. So you have a data matrix, and you apply it, and you get a result. And it's unclear what are the assumptions that need to be satisfied for your, for your analysis to hold. And so here are some of the issues that crop up in practice that can be problematic when you're applying principal components. So often you have missing data. Entries of your genotype matrix might be missing. Some of it is missing at random. Some of it has, has structure to it. And it's often not clear how to deal with this systematically in this framework. Uh, another set of challenges is what's called LD, linkage disequilibrium. So different SNPs are correlated amongst each other. And so what that means is, effectively, they have different contributions to the covariance. Right? And so then the question is, how do you want to weight the contributions of each of these SNPs while forming this covariance matrix? So one way to kind of handle this is to try to define what is the probabilistic model underlying PCA. Right? So PCA is a procedure. It does something. And the question is, what is this procedure trying to achieve? And so by writing down a probabilistic model, we kind of uh, make clear what the assumptions are that underlie PC. All right, so in the next uh, section, I'll talk about a probabilistic model for doing PCA. So this literature goes back to uh, a couple of very nice papers from the machine learning literature. Uh, so there is the paper from Sam Rowise and Tipping and Bishop. And so what they defined is a fully generative probabilistic model for principal components analysis. So by, what, uh, by a fully generative model, what we mean is I give you some parameters, and this model is going to tell me what's the probability 
of seeing the data that we observe given those parameters. And of course, that's not the problem we care about. The problem we care about is once we have the data, we want to infer the parameters, but then there is a number of statistical techniques we can use to do that. Right? So the first step is to define this generative model. So we start with the hidden variable, z. So this is the projection of the nth data point. So remember, this data point lies in a k-dimensional space. So we say that z comes from a k-dimensional multivariate normal distribution, mean 0, identity covariance matrix. So once we have z, now we have the parameters of our model, which is a matrix w and a new parameter, <coughs> sigma squared, which is a variance parameter. So given values for z and given these two parameters, we can now generate our data, x sub n, according to this distribution. And what this distribution is telling us is you take z, it's a k-dimensional vector, transform it through w, so, so w is an m by k matrix, so now you get an m-dimensional vector, and your x is essentially going to be centered around this m-dimensional vector with some noise added to it. So the additional parameter introduced here is this variance parameter, sigma squared. And we do this independently for each of the n data points. Yeah? Is the orthonormal constraint still on W? Yeah. Good question. So let's hold on to this. So, so far, there is no constraint on the W in the generator model. Right? We'll come to what constraints uh, we're going to impose on it when we do inference. So this is for each data point. You do this independently for all your n data points. And so now you can write down the joint probability density for x and z, your n data points, and that's simply going to be the product of each of these densities. Right? So simple uh, composition of probabilities here. All right, so now that you have a model, this has parameters, so two parameters, w and sigma squared, and we can ask what happens if we have uh, set the parameters to their maximum likelihood values. Right? So you have a model. You have data. Now, natural thing to do is let's try to set the parameters to the maximum likelihood. So, yeah. Is there an implied assumption over here that since your everything is independent when you say like when you throw those out of the dynamics in the in the covariance structure, is there an implicit assumption that the SNPs are independent? There's no LD. Right. Yeah. So let me let me put let me put one more slide up. Okay. So. So w what is the assumption here? So let's look at the covariance matrix amongst all of the SNPs. Right? So this is the covariance of xn. So this is an m by m matrix. So what's the assumption here? The assumption is this covariance matrix is not a full, it's not an m by m matrix. Instead, it has two components. So the first component is this quantity, which is w, w transpose. So this is. If w is m by k, it's a rank k matrix. And if k is small, this is low rank. And then you have this component, full rank, but that's coming from the noise. So basically, the assumption is the covariance matrix splits into two parts. One is the low rank part, and the second is the noise part. Right. So it's it, it, the, the, one of the nice things about Writing it this way is now you can actually start extending it in various frameworks. So right now, this is fairly simple. But we can also talk about how we can relax some of these assumptions. All right, so, so you have a model. You can write down its likelihood, log likelihood for this model. And uh, that's not too difficult. And then the question you can ask is, let's maximize this likelihood. So if you compute the MLE, what is it going to look like? So this was a question that was answered in this paper by Tipping and Bishop. And they found that you can actually analytically compute the maximum likelihood. And so if you look at the maximum likelihood value for w, one of the parameters, it is basically almost similar to doing eigen decomposition. Right? So w is going to depend on the top k eigenvectors. And then they're going to get scaled a little bit by the eigenvalues the diagonal matrix of the top k eigenvalues minus sigma squared. So it's not exactly doing PCA, but it's almost there. And in fact, 
if you take the limit as sigma squared goes to 0, you get back principal components analysis. Yeah. In practice, though, it is the case because the directions are all the same. By adding that sigma squared, you're not changing the eigenvectors because it's sigma square i, nor the ranking of the eigenvalues. So the solution is, in practice, equivalent to that of PTA as a d squared type of Exactly, yes, that's right. Yeah. yeah, it's just that you have this additional parameter, and of course, if you take the limit to zero, you get exactly what you would get by PCA. Yeah? Didn't you also derive the sigma squared, the variance directed to the data you can factor in zero? Exactly, yeah, you can do that, and it has the natural interpretation. It's going to be all of the residual eigenvalues. So you take the top k eigenvalues, right, and that forms your subspace. Sigma squared is going to be the remaining k plus 1 to m. The so you say that sigma squared is kind of the PCA uh, type of position, but here you said that the position depends on sigma squared. So this is somehow, like you, you want to uh, derive both from the data, right? You want to know both uh, the W matrix and yeah. the sigma squared variance. Right. Yeah, so the procedure would be you do your eigen decomposition, you compute eigenvectors and eigenvalues. Sigma squared is essentially the last last m minus k eigenvalues, the and the average of them, yeah. And then, you plug it in and then you plug it in here, and that gives you w hat. <coughs> All right, so, so, so far this approach hasn't really bought as much, I mean, apart from clarifying the assumptions, you still have to do an eigen decomposition, so it hasn't necessarily solved the problem. Um, of computing uh, principal components. But the other thing to keep in mind is this is an, uh, this probabilistic model is an interesting probabilistic model because it has hidden variables associated with it. So if you go back, you have the z's and the x's, and we don't get to observe the z's in practice, so the z's form hidden variables. So it's a latent variable model or a hidden variable model. And so now if you have hidden variables, then you have uh, another class of algorithms that you can do to infer maximum likelihood, and that's given by the EM algorithm. So instead of computing the MLE by eigen decomposition, you can apply the EM algorithm in this se setting. All right? So how many people know EM? EM algorithm. Okay, most of you. So won't belabor. So the EM algorithm. It's basically an iterative algorithm to compute the maximum likelihood of uh, estimates. And so in this setting, we have hidden variable z and parameters, w and sigma squared. And so the high level idea is you start with some guess about your parameters, and you iterate between two steps. The e step is where, given your parameters, you guess the hidden variables, or more accurately, you compute the posterior probability over the hidden variables. And in the m step, given your current guess for the hidden variables, you re-estimate the parameters. And you iterate this process, and this is guaranteed to increase or never decrease the likelihood until convergence. So in the context of the EM, you can actually derive, write down these updates for the E and the M step. And assuming that sigma squared is 0, you get updates that look like this. So starting with some guess for W, you're estimating Z. And then using these estimates for Z, you re-estimate W, and you repeat this process. Now, for those of you who have looked at linear regression, this kind of update should be fairly familiar. This kind of x transpose, x inverse, x transpose, that's kind of the least squares estimate of linear regression. And effectively, what you're doing in the E and the M step is regressing x on W to get Z, and the other way around to get M. So this is related to a class of approaches called alternating least squares for computing these kinds of matrix factorization. All right, so now the question to ask is, we have eigen decomposition, and now we have the EM, and when might this algorithm prove to be a good thing to use? So now let's look at the computational complexity of applying these EM updates. So the main thing here is there are these matrix inversions. Often that's when a lot of the bottleneck happens computationally. 
So you have inverting a matrix here and inverting another matrix here. But it turns out that these are k by k matrices. And if k is small, then those should be easy. And then it's a set of matrix, matrix multiplications. And so if you actually do the computation, you'll see that both the E and the M step have complexity that's linear in N, M, and K. Okay? So there's a, kind of, there's a matrix inversion, which is, depends only on the K. And for small K, it's going to be dominated by these terms. So the EM algorithm is something we'll run for some number of iterations, I iterations until convergence. And each iteration costs NMK. So if your k is small, then this leads to a linear time algorithm for computing principal components. Now in practice, of course, this assumes that you're going to run it for a small number of iterations. EM can have slow convergence. It's well known in the literature. And so you can use accelerated uh, algorithms for EM, uh, which often lead to much faster convergence with very little additional computational complexity. So all of this discussion has happened um, with no kind of particular reference to the fact that we are dealing with genetic data. Right? So this is all completely general. Your x could be gene expression data or images or anything. And these results could hold. But one thing specific that we are dealing with is genotypes. And so the question is, if we knew that we are dealing with genetic data, can we improve on this time complexity, even though it's linear? Um, it can still be slow for large values of NNM. So let's go back and look at where the bottleneck lies. So in each of the E and the M step, the key computation is you have a matrix X, your genotype matrix, and you're computing a matrix vector product between the genotype matrix and a vector B. And so this genotype matrix is fixed. It's an M by N matrix. Once it's observed, it doesn't change throughout the algorithm. The vector B, on the other hand, that can potentially change with every iteration. These are your estimates of W and Z. And of course, they, they can change. But in each iteration, you do K of these matrix vector multiplications. And so the, that's where the NMK complexity comes from. So the hope is, because this is a genotype matrix and it's fixed, maybe we can do some additional pre-processing and use the structure of this genotype matrix to bring down the cost of these computations. Yeah, for large data sets, okay. we, we, okay. We'll, we'll come back to the simulations, but yeah. Mm -hmm. But how much more? How much more? Because the M I always thought of as an expensive procedure because it's iterative and, and, and uh, so what's the gain? To yeah, so um, there is both a memory and a computation cost. Okay. So it turns out that for many large data sets, it becomes computationally infeasible, even, uh, even after running for. Yeah. You just can't do it on the kinds of machines you might have. Of course, there are these randomized approximation algorithms, which are also these iterative algorithms. And those offer a kind of a competitive alternative. And you could try those. Um, and as far as iterations, generally, what we have observed is um, once you do the acceleration, the convergence is extremely rapid. So it's of the order of 10 to 20 iterations, never more than that. So are you thinking about getting full posterior probabilities? Yeah. yeah. Going towards that, but not, I mean, sure. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So in everything I've. You won't really get by it. It's just uh, SVG. Right. So yeah, 
in fact, you almost get, in all of these cases, you get the posterior distribution for very little additional cost. Um, and, and that's another added benefit of running these algorithms. If you want error bars on your principal components, right. all of that falls out of this. That's right. Yeah. Right, so coming back to this one um, computational issue, so we're going to do some pre-processing on the X matrix, genotype matrix that is fixed. And then in every additional iteration, hopefully these matrix vector multiplications are not going to be too expensive. So that's the general idea. And so specifically, it turns out that this um, kind of approach has been explored in recent theoretical computer science literature. And what they've shown is you can actually do some pre-processing so that in every iteration, this matrix vector product is not m times n. That's the naive matrix vector multiplication, but m times n divided by the scaling factor. So essentially, you get a log n or a log m speed up for these kinds of matrix vector multiplications. And so if n is, say, a million, then this can be a speed up of anywhere between 10 to 20 of the algorithm, potentially. So, so I'd like to describe this algorithm. It's, a, it's an interesting um, algorithm and not very hard to, to describe. So this is described in uh, a paper about uh, maybe eight years back. It's called the Mailman algorithm. Um, so here's a simple way to think about it. So we want to, we have a matrix X. It's an M by N matrix. Uh, let's assume for now it's binary. So genotypes are 0, 1, 2, but that doesn't matter. We'll treat it as binary for now. And again, let's assume that the dimension M is related to N as the log. Again, all of these are just for simplifying the discussion. And our goal is to compute this matrix vector product, X times B. So the key insight is if X is binary, if you look at every column, so here is an one such realization of X. It's a two by four matrix. Every column of X is basically a binary vector of length two. So of course there are a finite number of these binary vectors. So we can rewrite this matrix in terms of the dictionary of all possible binary vectors of length two. So you take X and you decompose it as this matrix U, which is all possible binary vectors. So you have four of them in this case. And then you have to simply say which of these four vectors is present in each of these columns. And that's what the P matrix tells you. Okay. So in other words, let's say you look at the first column, that's 0, 0. So that's the first entry in the U matrix. And so you will have a 1 for the first column and 0 everywhere else in the P matrix. Right? The second one is 0, 1. So that's, um, that's the second column. So you'll have 0 everywhere else except in the second entry of the second column. Right? So x can be decomposed into these two matrices. The U matrix is fixed. Right? This is only depending on the size of x. And the P matrix, of course, is is a function of x. Yeah. So which one? The column one zero. The third column in the U and matrix. The third column yeah. here? So the third column, yeah. So one zero is not present anywhere in X. Yes. So So the property of the P uh, matrix is there's going to be exactly one one for each of the columns. Right? All right. So now with this representation, we're now de going to decompose our matrix vector multiplication x times b into two steps. We first compute b's product with p, and then we take that and we compute its product with u n. And so it turns out that each of these two steps can be done efficiently. So the first product can be computed in O of n time, simply because the matrix P has only n ones totally. Right? There's only one one in each column. 
So there are n ones in total. And so any matrix vector multiplication can be done in O of n time. So that's the first thing. The second multiplication, that's less obvious. So this one, but that can also be done in O of n time. And the basic idea is, let's say you start with this product, U of n times D. So the first row of U of 1 has this structure where there are half of them are zeros, the rest of them are ones. This is a binary representation. If that's the most significant bit, that's how you're going to write it. And then under them, you have the U matrix for n over 2, because that's, ha that's half the size of the original matrix. So now you can compute this matrix vector product. You can write it in this form. And so you have a recursion where computing this product involves computing the product on a matrix of half the size. And you have to do some work which is proportional to order n. So this recursive algorithm has total cost of O n. So the bottom line, these two steps are O n, total is O n. And so instead of a multiplicative cost of n times log n, which is what you would need for naive matrix vector, you've done it in O of n time. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. As a more more as a binary as a logistic or one of those things. Yeah, that's a very good question. So everything here. So that's kind of uh, we have we're cheating a little bit because we have this Gaussian model, but everything we've observed is zeros and ones. And in practice, you would want to have a better likelihood. And people have explored some of these likelihoods in the literature. But usually, the, so we have explored some of this, but it actually makes it a little bit more complex, uh, simply because you no longer have um, closed form posterior probabilities. So you have to do different kinds of approximations there. So we've stuck to this partly because uh, we want an algorithm that exactly matches SVD while still giving you computational gains. And now, of course, there may be no reason to exactly match SVD if your data comes from a different distribution. But again, a lot of this can be ported into that framework. So we do definitely want to go in that direction. And of course, this can be generalized. So this is not, if you have a matrix which is big, you just split it into, uh, into blocks of size log n by n. And each of them is O of n time. And so the total time is going to be mn over log n. So this, this all carries over to other matrices. If you have a ternary matrix, again, all of this carries over. The log just changes from log to the base 2 to log to the base 3. And that's, again, a, a general result for finite alphabets. And finally, what matters here is not just co computing, but also memory. Right? Memory is uh, sometimes even more of a hard constraint than the computation time. It turns out that the memory requirements are actually comparable to storing your genotype as a bit matrix, or a 0, 1, 2 matrix. So you don't lose much by going into this representation memory-wise. All right, so uh, just some simulations. Uh, this is a very so, so again, this is preliminary work, so we're still doing a lot of the, uh, a lot of the uh, validation. So this is a very simple simulation. You have a single population that splits into k subpopulations. And then we have m SNPs, n individuals. We have chosen k equals 6 here. And there is FSD, which measures the drift from the ancestor into the descendant population. Right? And so there is a, we know the ground truth here. And so we have generated data according to this phylogeny. So the first simulation is to look at the accuracy of the results of this EM. So the x-axis is FST. So roughly, you can think of it as uh, how separable are the populations. As you go from right to left, they become less separable. And the y-axis is one measure of accuracy here, which is relative to SVD, what's the residual error of EM? Right? Both have a residual error. And you, if they are good, if they are approximating the same quantity, then it should be close to 1. So, so generally, we see that for different values of, of 
FST, different values of K, you essentially get the same answer as, as doing an SVD. And this is with a small number of iterations, less than 10 in most settings. Now let's look at runtime. Um, so now what we are doing here is keeping the number of SNPs fixed, and we're varying the number of individuals. K is five in all of this. So you're moving from 10,000 to 100,000 individuals. So the black curve here is a method called fast PCA. It's actually based on a randomized SVD. So doing full-blown SVD would, would not even complete on, on these problem instances. So this is already an approximation that we're making here. And the red and the blue are two versions of the EM algorithm that we've described. The difference between them is the blue is slightly more memory efficient while being computationally a little bit slower. And so again, here you see the memory usage, and that's where you'll see that the blue one is much better than the red one, whereas fast PCA is, is, is of course, uh, more memory efficient than either of them. But it seems like there is definitely a win in moving to this EM framework and in also working with this or using the, the genotype structure of the data. And we're looking at 100,000 individuals, but now we have data sets where it's five times bigger with 10 times more SNPs. And so you might actually see these differences being even more significant with these larger data sets. All right, so, um, so this is just ongoing work. Um, but I just want to say some of the advantages of thinking about the, the model is one thing is handling missing data. So all of this falls naturally uh, in the EM framework. And so that's, uh, that's a nice thing. And that's something that we have implemented and we are testing. Um, selecting K, again, that's a, a thorny problem. Um, and with a model, now you can use model selection criteria to select K, so that's another uh, a nice thing. And some open questions, which we haven't yet uh, thought about carefully here. So one is modeling LD. So what happens if SNPs are actually linked over and beyond this structured covariance? Um, the second is going beyond Gaussian outputs. And I think there's, again, a lot of interesting things. There has been a few works that have been done, but uh, this framework is general enough to, to explore those directions. So just to summarize, I think uh, a couple of takeaways. Um, one of the things, one of the lessons for us at least is it's useful to separate the procedure from what you're trying to estimate. So that, that's where the, uh, that's where I think the probabilistic model approach is, is, is a nice thing to have. Uh, it clarifies your assumptions. It allows you to generalize in, in different ways. And in this particular setting, it leads to efficient inference as well. Um, this fast matrix vector multiplication uh, I think it's an interesting idea. I haven't seen it used much in genetics. Uh, but for all kinds of genotype data, you have this general framework where there's a loop where you're doing a bunch of matrix vector multiplications. And it seems like for free, you can, or not for free, with some coding, you can get uh, a reasonable, but maybe a 10 to 20 uh, magnitude speed up, uh, which could be useful in a lot of settings. So this was all uh, work that was done with uh, Iran. Um, but I want to give a shout out to Aman, who was a, a summer undergraduate student who coded up all, most of these algorithms in about a couple of weeks. Um, so he's been a phenomenal uh, student. Um, and uh, yeah, happy to take questions and uh, just also uh, throwing out an ad for postdoc positions. Right, so if you look at the covariance matrix, it has this decomposition. So you have one part of your LD coming from population structure, the low rank component. Everything else is independent. However, even within a population, there's LD, right? So over and above the LD that comes due to population structure, there is LD within the population, right? So that in, in literature, you often find the term used background LD versus admixture LD. Um, 
So you take a population like Europeans, uh, assuming that they are a homogeneous population that is LD within the European population. So from a modeling point of view, what that means is the noise is no longer a diagonal covariance matrix. It can have a little bit more structure. It could be uh, some other kind of covariance matrix. And could be composed in the sum of three matrices instead of two. Presumably, right. yes, absolutely. And of course, uh, so from a modeling point of view, I think that's doable. Now we also have to think about the inference and how, whether we can apply those, uh, those kinds of uh, LD included models to large data sets. Yeah, that's a great question. So, yeah, so this goes back to uh, this uh, trying to do other kinds of inference with this idea. So, there is some literature, for example, where let's say you have a general problem, like MC, you want to do MCMC on some problem. And it turns out by introducing these binary indicator variables, and you can, you can subsample your data and do MCMC much faster. So, you can think of these as kind of discretization variables or indicator variables. And it'll be interesting to actually think about what happens, whether you can use this as a way of, uh, of doing fast inference while still kind of integrating out the uncertainty. Yeah, it, it, yeah, it could be very interesting. And even in the genotype case, um, again, these genotypes come from some, some probabilistic model. Right? There is genotype likelihoods associated with them, and you might still want to apply PCA on that. And so it, it makes sense to actually think about whether this framework allows, allows you to handle that setting. Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting question, whether um, there is a, a natural connection with haplotype-based models and these kinds of more uh, Gaussian likelihood models. Uh, so there's this paper by Wen and Stevens that I had there, uh, does some of that. So what they show is a link between these multivariate models and PAC models like Lee and Stevens. And the idea is there's some kind of appeal to central limit theorem, which says that when you average across many individuals, uh, it converges to this multivariate Gaussian, and then you have to derive the mean and the covariance that captures LD. Um, again, that may not be the best model for this setting, but those kinds of models could be a good starting point. I see. There's a binary structure. Right, right. I see. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. All right. Uh, no more questions? Coffee. Thanks. Yeah.